Good morning and welcome to our live talk program. This is Lloyd Grubb here, your host on Revive Reform Radio, doing our live talk program covering wisdom for living on you this year, Friday morning, rise and shine. And this morning here, we're looking at the topic, why spanking a child with a rod will deliver his soul from hell. Why spanking a child with a rod will de deliver his soul from hell. This is what we're looking at here this morning as we do our live talk program covering wisdom for living this is how you need to live with your family let us pray our father who art in heaven in heaven i thank you again O lord for your blessings in our lives we thank you for your guidance pray that you may be with me and those who are listening that our spirit may be with us and that you may guide us along as we study this uh, very important interesting to topic may you bless us we pray for christ's sake amen so again this morning here we're looking at this a uh, very um, important especially for the times we're living in where we're living in a time where there's brats on every side people out of control and not having any type of self-control and not being fearful of the dangers out there and so this topic um, goes to that in a powerful way so again why spanking a child with a rod will deliver his soul from hell from hell and um kind of the point here i'm focusing on is um to teach a, a child from an early age that there are bad consequences to doing wrong or disobedience so this is really important what we're doing is it is for the child good it is per se not for your good um unless you are sadistic and have some screws loose uh, the discipline is for the child's well-being now the bible does say that you will give you'll have rest because if the child is not disciplined the child will not give you rest but you're doing this for the child's well-being and this is important uh, most parents when they start to argue things they argue it from their point of view or they think they're doing it um i guess to benefit the child when they do not administer discipline. So we're very specific here. We're not talking about um, the discipline as a sense of, um, you know, keeping time, keeping schedule, um, cleaning your room. We're talking about when authority, reason, functioning breaks down and disobedience or rudeness or destructive behavior is displayed. Um, then the rod of correction is brought in. The rod of correction is not for the training of the child, so to speak, is when things get out of control. I need to bring back order to the situation. So why spank why spanking a child with a rod will deliver his soul from hell? And we get this from Proverbs twenty three, verse twelve through fourteen. Proverbs twenty three, verse twelve through fourteen. And it states Apply thine heart unto instruction and thine ear to the word of knowledge. So I pause there. No, I don't pause. I like to read it one time through. Apply thine heart to instruction. That means you're gonna have to like, okay, okay, okay. I'm gonna do. I'm gonna do this <laughs> because some people don't have the heart to do it. There's things that you know, like if many people would have to hunt. Not all, but many people if they have to hunt their own food, their own chicken or their their own um, deer or whatever it is, and kill it themselves they probably decide to go vegetarian um vegan immediately if they had to hunt it so there's things in life that you know you'll point it off on somebody else um but you don't want to do it because you don't have the guts to do it but at the end of the day it's very important it's you have to apply your heart it's a heart thing you have to be in your heart and then ear to the word of knowledge because what's coming next is not easy and I, and I always have to remind you who is right in this. Uh, it is clear in my mind that Solomon himself would not have been um, disciplining his kids. It would be too many kids. It, it would be um, um, overwhelming. So you have to apply your heart. Now, what do you have to apply your heart to? And um, what instruction is going to be given next? And thine ear to the word of knowledge. What knowledge is going to be given next? Here is the knowledge. Without... Um, with old, sorry, with old, not correction from the child. For if thou beatest him with the rod, 
he shall not die. Thou shalt beat him with the rod, and thou shalt and shall deliver his soul from hell. So he will not die. That's a guarantee. You beat the child, the child is not going to die. That means, obviously, we're not talking about beating a child near death. This is not what the Bible is saying. And by that statement, it's already clear that that's not what we're talking about. We're not talking about abuse here. So obviously, author is not talking about um, physically abusing a child where a child could die. This is talking about bringing back order, you know. So a quick example of that is like if a child throwing a temper tantrum. That means the child is total out of control and start trashing about. That trashing about behavior where a child does that, you know, you ever see a fish where it jumps on a boat out of the water and all of a sudden a fish just start trashing about and, you know, that's out of control. A child that does that, number one, they could hurt themselves. So it's important and most parents don't think about that. The child could hurt themselves. I normally will hurt themselves. And the problem is as a child grow older, that trash about can lead to some severe consequence. Either the child sooner or later will start beating the parents. So that's kind of like logical. You didn't beat the child when the child was young. When the child gets old, the child beat you. The child beat authority. I, I believe that some of this problem happening, not all of it, but some of that happening where you have young men um, being shot by cops many times the situation got out of hand and sometimes it's the cop uh, and that the cop should be tried and there should be no defense of a police that does that but many times i believe is that the, the that child is a child that the parent couldn't discipline the mother couldn't discipline the father couldn't discipline and the, the police had to pull their gun and discipline them so you don't want it to get to that so you you want to be able to teach the child not to trash about thrash about, I don't know if it was the right word for it, and um, if it's T-H-R-T, but not to be like flailing, like flailing about and jumping around and screaming and wallowing on the floor, um, you got to pick that child up and whack that child a few times and get them back into their senses, because you don't want that child to grow up and with that thing. This is where you have people who are married and then because they can't get their way, or they disagree with their spouse. They start breaking stuff in the house and start screaming and going mad. And you see a person behaving like that, you realize, oh, nobody beat that out of them when they were young. And so as they get old, they learn to throw a of fit and nobody will respond to them. So this is important. Another thing why this is so important, and I mean, I'm going to be talking about a lot of what, why it's important. Um, when it comes on to children, it's like you have a person they learn to do certain bad behavior, uh, no consequence, you know, like fly up into the face of a person. You know, you fly up in the face of a person. I tell me that's a person that they probably didn't get some wax when they were young. Because if they got some whacking when they were young, then they will learn that say, you don't fly up in the face of anybody and start to go off like you want to fight them. And I've seen people do that and they get there after the first two or three punches in their face, then normally what happened and learned, uh, probably shouldn't flap in the face because I'm actually exposing myself to be punched. And they learn that. And you learn to back yourself down. But you have kids that never was taught that. So they don't understand how to control their tempers. And they don't understand how that there's not, you know, you can't always lose it um, before people. But I believe a lot of this goes back to the childhood. As I say, um, it, the longer I live is the more I see, you know, I used to hear they talk about um, psychologists would always go back to the childhood when there's a problem. And I've thought about it. And then the longer I live is the more I prove that you bring me a person with a problem. And 90 something percent of the time, probably 80 something percent of the time, I would say it was something that was cultivated that they did themselves when they were young or the parents cultivated in them or allowed in them and now they're grown adults and whether it be their job situation or their the sp spouse just imagine now they have a situation where it's a marital situation or whatever situation the behavior that was never curbed but when they were younger that behavior became now a problem as they get older so this is why it's important for the love of your child 
to take care of certain things and train it into them from their young. So when they get old, they do not have to try to undo these things. But remember, these things are developed at an early age. And this is important to note and to understand. You're just doing this for the child's sake, not for um, your sake. So um, I'm going to read the text again before I move on. I'll come back to it. It says, withhold not correction from the child. For if thou beatest him with the rod, he shall not die. Thou shalt beat him with the rod and shall deliver his soul from hell. Whatever that rod is. Now I might say this before I move on to the next part of the presentation. Um, if you, if you, if, sorry, if you contemplate that it's important to always note that the the beating again, as I said in the beginning, the beating or the using of a rod, quote unquote, whatever that rod is, uh, is a last resort. And it's important to always note this. It's nothing much to note. It's a simple. Uh, when beating is put in place, it's a last resort. If you're beating a child on a daily basis, then you're doing something wrong. Then you need to pray study, learn, talk to some other parents, find out some new methodology, and you practice something else. Mm -hmm. uh, beating should not be something that is a normalcy. This should be something that is a very infrequent thing that is done when things are totally out of control and you run out of options. Very important. Uh, now, that doesn't mean that it, it, I'm just saying that you do that probably once in a child's lifetime, but it could be. It depends on how skillful you are to Teach a child to avoid wrong. Again, the aim is that you're teaching the child from an early age that there are bad consequences to doing wrong and disobedience. This cannot be done with only beatings. This has to be done with teaching. you got to be able to demonstrate it. you got to be able to show it because there's things that happen in life that I think parents often miss an opportunity to teach the child verbally and by eyesight the results of wrong it, I don't think it's it could be wrong but in my mind I don't think it's a bad thing if you're driving past and you see some people living on that bridge that you tell the child the, the, the story of the prodigal son and then you explain to the child the results I'm gonna talk about that a little later in the presentation you explain to the child the results of the prodigal son's lifestyle and how the prodigal son end up normally on their bridge. That not all prodigal son has a home to go back to and a father that can put a robe and a ring on his finger. Um, a lot of prodigal sons, their parents are broke anyhow and they can't afford that. So it's important for you to note that. Don't miss an opportunity because, see, that's one less spanking. You get that? It's not putting down others. It's just you're showing life in the real. You're showing life in the real. You see Uncle, Uncle John, Uncle John, yeah, Uncle John love alcohol. Boom, here's your Uncle, there's Uncle John's lifestyle. And here's Uncle John's results. Because the aim, as I say, is to teach a child from an early age that there are bad consequences or negative consequences to doing wrong and negative consequences to disobedient. I don't think it's a wrong thing that if a, a person... Um, legitimately disobeyed the orders of the police and was doing crimes and the police load them up with bullets and they make the news and your child see it. There's nothing wrong to sit there and explain to your child, hey look, you see, he didn't listen to his parents. He don't listen to authority. That's his problem. Not just parents, but authority. And look at how he ended. He sent a message to that child that there's negative consequence to doing wrong and when that is taught and that gets a hold of the child the child will be better situation that you don't have to be spanking so you do you, you use all available means that's what i say right all available means now in proverbs chapter 22 verse 15 proverbs 22 verse 15 says foolishness is bound up sorry foolishness is bound in the heart of a child but the rod of correction shall drive it far from them you could actually say this, especially think about the opiate epidemic right now going on. It's not the foolishness in people's heart. People are very foolish. And we're in a world, um, sorry, we're in a country that they have enshrined no spanking. And so if 
all these kids growing up with their parents. Oh, I don't spank my child. They're dead. And the parents, they don't know what they did wrong. Because they don't believe in the Bible. They believe the Bible is fairy tale. So they'll never receive this type of instruction. And most of them will be appalled even at the topic. And my topic again is why spank why spanking a child with a rod will deliver his soul from hell. Very important. They, they're so silly with this type of stuff. They believe, oh, it's abuse. And they follow simple, the simplicity of Oprah Winfrey. And they're destroying a whole generation. See, if you don't train a child that there's, there's things to be afraid of, you should be very afraid. The child just go headlong into stupidity. And they can't say, what, what's going to be the bad result? Because nobody ever told them that there's consequence. They was never... Um, putting them when they were young that there's consequence to bad behavior and disobedience because it says it's going to make the child have no self-esteem well think about this now and and if if i had a i wish i had a bull horn i probably just mess up your ears but i'll just go bam <laughs> with the bull horn and then just get your attention and then i'm going to tell you this all these kids now growing up they're dying of opiate and all kind of drop it epidemic they have no self-esteem they depress. So how is that working out? You tell you bring me a child. And I remember the first time I read Ellen G. White said the statement that you can find Ellen G. White. She says, The most miserable children are the, the least disciplined children. Isn't that fascinating? And I remember reading that and then I start, I like immediately I read it, I was like, she right. Wow. That's like a mother talking. When I say a mother, mother of human beings, adults, this is somebody that's old and gray here. That's wisdom. You are guaranteed. Now, I said this to you. Observe. You look at the miserable, wretched, little bratty child, and you're going to realize there's no discipline. They don't discipline this child, and this child is free to eat all the candy they can eat. First thing, they wake up in the morning. They can throw a tantrum in the store they can't do all and the parents will not discipline and the parents are like oh poor me this child is so hard to discipline i can't discipline this child this child has no behavior and i'm like it's a child a child gonna do what you tell him to do but oh the child is so hard i'm like the child is so hard no you're so silly that's what happened you bring me a child that's miserable i'm gonna tell you and I'm going to tell you that this is a hundred percent. I've never seen it fail. And it's a child that is not disciplined. And a miserable child. Now somebody say, but could that person be depressed and it's not because they're not disciplined? Their parents are not disciplined. Their parents are depressed and not disciplined. I've never seen it. You bring, and you know why this, that's, this is so powerful? You bring me a miserable peer, adult. I'm going to tell you, they weren't disciplined when they were young. So somebody said, but how could discipline, how could a rod help a person to be happy? Because I'm going to tell you, one of the number one cause of depression that nobody talks about is people can't get what they want. And people doing stupid, dumb stuff. And the dumber, stupider people do stuff and live is the more depressed they are. Because when you do stuff that is dumb, you, you end up being depressed. Now, I'm read a text again for you. Foolishness is bound up in the heart of a child. Pause there. When you do foolish stuff, don't you end up with foolish results? You play silly games and you win silly prizes. But the prizes could be you get your hands stuck in a meat grinder. And it's grinding off your fingers. Now for the rest of your life, you have to say to somebody, somebody can say, oh man, you're missing two fingers there. What happened? And now you're going to have to recount or you're going to think about that dumb story and feel depressed and feel like a fool. Like you're a loser. You put an L on your, your, your forehead. Just think about people doing stuff that like you said, that's a, that's a losing, stupid thing to do. Those are depressed people making a fool of themselves, making a jackass of themselves. A jackass of themselves in public before somebody. And when you check it out, because I've had friends and I've know them. This is not me talking from hypotheses and speculation. People I know, no dip discipline, no, never got a spanking, never get a discipline in their life. And they're miserable wretches because they do dumb stuff or they can't get what they want and they go depressed. 
or they think life is going to work out the way and it doesn't work out that way because they have a foolish idea of how life is supposed to work out. And then they're the person like, it didn't work out the way I thought. Yeah, because it's stupid. It's foolishness that's born out in your heart that your parents didn't drive it out of you. And now that you're a grown person, you're just depressed. As I say, you look at the drug epidemic, all these kids, oh, they, they, they never get spanking and they have self-esteem. Really? <laughs> <laughs> it's the stupidest thing. They have self esteem. Because spanking a child is gonna make the child depressed. Spanking a child for, for, for trying to burn themselves or burn the house down, that's gonna make somebody depressed. You should be depressed because somebody's trying to stop you from burning the house down. I, I don't think so. I think burning the house down is gonna cause you to be depressed. Imagine if you grew up and you grew up and you have to have the stain that you were playing around. And because you were stupid and nobody didn't, didn't, didn't discipline you, you push your sibling through the window and cause them to fall on many stories and die. And now for the rest of your life, you have that stupid, evil little chucky um, at thing that you did that you're going to have to live with. You could go to your life. And most people go to your life depressed because of doing that. And so somebody will say, what would you prefer? To spank your child a few times and bring them into order, work in order, or to allow them to be stupid and then push the child through, the, the sister or brother through the window and cause them to die at the early age and then live with that stain. Which one is more punishing? You know what most of the, our citizens will say? Spanking a child because it's going to cause them to have self-esteem problem. Really? But pushing a child through the window is not going to cause them self-esteem problem? Burning themselves taking all these drugs and dying young of drug overdose, that's not going to cause self-esteem problem. Being a hoe at 16 is not going to cause self-esteem problem. Picking up STDs in your teens is not going to cause self-esteem problem. I think it will. How about you? And like, there's not silence, there's crickets in the background, <laughs> literally. Uh, you're probably hearing them. Uh, there's many people who in America be like, I can't hear this, I can't take this. And I'm like, you are a depressed kid. You can not, not listen to me. And you're you're going to be burying your kid at a young age because nobody disciplined them. Now, this famous story we're going to go to. Oh, and I'll finish reading that text again for a second time. But the rod of correction shall drive it far from them. When I say far, far from them, they must see certain things and they must know that's bad. Don't touch it. How many kids you see now, even today, is going to go in the emergency room? Because the parents didn't teach them to not touch stuff. And they're going to take their parents liquid mar marijuana, the THC. And they're going to drink it. And have to rush them to the emergency room. Because their parents didn't tell them, look, don't touch my stuff. Okay? And the first time you touch my stuff, I'll whack, whack your butt. And the parents do that. The child learn, you know what happened? Don't drink bleach. <laughs> don't drink bleach. All right? Now, I'm not saying that you shouldn't. You should child-proof your house. You do due diligence. That means nothing can come back and nobody can ever say that you did, you were negligent. But while you do diligence, you shouldn't avoid, you know, of teaching your child, beating stupidity out of your child and foolishness. Because there's a certain point where, I'm going to tell you, I've heard stories where the parents do diligence. They put safety locks, you know, the child-proof locks on... um you know, the, the cabinets, they pop that cabinet open, the phone ring, without thinking, they reach over the phone, and within a hot second, that child have something in their mouth drinking. And shock. And you're like, how did that happen so fast? Because guess what happened? No matter how much your child proof your home, you got to make sure that foolishness is driven out of the child. And there's a way to drive it out of the child. And it's called a rod of correction. It could most of the time it's leather, leather from cowhide. Ain't nothing wrong with that. Don't listen to the silly, silly people. As I said, they're burying their kids. Which one is more painful? Having the heart to discipline your child or watch your child being shot? Think about all these young men. You bring me a hundred of them in the ghetto right now. You take any ghetto randomly, spin a wheel, put it on all the ghettos, all the black areas, I should say, in America. You you grab me one hundred young random hoodlums thugs that's what i'm calling himself i'm not calling them that 
Uh, you bring me into them and uh, you show me and I'm guaranteed probably 80 something or 90 something percent of them the parents don't discipline them they can't talk the parents can't even talk to them can't even talk to them as the parents probably get a punch in the face and you give me probably a five years and probably 80 something percent of them gonna be dead either they kill themselves or the police kill them or they in prison or they drugged up on the side of the street somewhere it is important, but again, we have a whole society would argue, oh no, that's going to make them have no self-esteem. You can bring me any of these young men, most of those young black men, anyhow, they have Ritalin or some of the mental health drugs. How is that self-esteem going? Most of these kids on drugs, anyhow, there's no self-esteem. You ever meet a person that's undisciplined, that has self-esteem? They don't even know what that is. They probably can't even pronounce or spell the word. First Samuel chapter 2, two verse 22 Shoot 25. This is the story of Samuel. And you know, Samuel is very famous in the Bible because he never disciplined his sons. And God ended up to kill his sons. That's important for you to note. He never disciplined his sons, and God ended up to kill his sons. So you keep that in mind. Remember, it is to train up a child the way he should go, that when he's old, he should not depart. Over the years, I can say all of these because I've seen. So many kids that were never disciplined. They were never trained either type of discipline because you know there's two types. There's the regiment. We're going to talk about it in a second. And then there's the physical discipline. Uh, a lot of kids that never got that even though they went to church and the parents came to believe in the Bible. And when they went, got old, they just walk away from God and Bible because they're undisciplined and they go live the prodigal son lifestyle. And many of them die before ever coming back up and waking up while they with the pigs that died in the pig pen. You don't want that to happen to your child. So in 1 Samuel chapter 2, verse 22 through 25, it says, Now Eli was very old and heard all that his sons did unto all Israel, and how they lay with the women that assembled at the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. So we don't know why these women were at the door. They probably came to worship like how um, the story of Eli's, not Eli, Samuel's mother came. So imagine Samuel's mother probably came praying and they're like, oh no, don't worry about that. Let me sleep with you. That's what they were doing. And the Bible says they caused Israel to sin. They were leading Israel down an immoral path. So these sons were doing things, but Eli he was old now. But as we know, he never disciplined those boys. Those boys were out of control. Verse 23 says, And he said unto them, Why do ye such things? For I hear of your evil dealings with all the people. Nay, my sons, for it is no good report that I hear. Ye make the Lord's people to transgress. Who is making the people to transgress? And what you notice this here is Eli's two sons. The people already, doesn't mean that people are not sinners. But they're encouraging the people into bad behavior. Verse 25, if one man sin against another, the judge shall judge him. But if a man sin against the Lord, who shall entreat for him? Notwithstanding, they hearken not unto the voice of their father, because the Lord would slay them. Because notice Eli tell you the principle. He knows the principle. This is where you're going to find even church leadership. And many parents, they know the principle, but they don't carry it out. All they do is talk. That's another thing that's a problem with parents, especially, you know, mothers. Mothers tend to be in that situation where they don't believe in anything beyond that. So they just, ah, yeah, 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 and they just be screaming all the time. And, you know, that's all. And the child, after a while, become numb to screaming and numb to deeper talk. And it's a point where I, I, I'm, I'm telling you, you limit your talk. You always lay down the rule and you limit your talk. You have to exercise self-control in this. A five-year-old not going to understand most of your vocabulary and what you're trying to explain. Even a five-year-old, it's very difficult for them to understand the story of the prodigal son and why people live on the bridge. So you could talk and talk and talk. Some things are going to get through but most not going to get through. But when the child receive the rod and they start to skip around and they start to do that dance, they'll understand better. It's real quick. 
it's only take probably the first strike and they start to understand, ouch, I got it, I got the lesson. So if I do this, I get that. Again, if a man sin the principle, if one man sin against another, the judge shall judge him. But if a man sin against the Lord, who shall entreat for him? So Eli understand the principle. What they were doing there was sin against the people per se, but it was the Lord because they were sinning against the people in the office of the priest. So they were doing it against the Lord. They were damaging the Lord because they were there standing as a representative of the Lord. So now who's going to plea? Are you going to plea with God when you do something like that? Because they're not pleading. They're going to keep doing what they're doing because they're having fun. And so they didn't hearken unto the father because the Lord would slay them. The Lord said, I'm going to kill those two boys. All right. You always remember that reality that God's system is not like man's system. See, man would talk all kind of stuff and excuse, excuse, excuse. But who's going to plead when the person starts going up against God? Then there's going to be a problem. Who's going to plead when the person starts doing evil? So that the society start to cry out and say, man, somebody need to stop this kid. So this is why at early age, you train the child to understand that there's consequences to bad behavior and disobedient. If you don't do this as a child get older and they become autonomous and they're on their own. They're not going to know that, hey, look, you can't go over there and do that type of stuff. No, you can't take people property. It's not your own. No, it doesn't matter if it was the person left the lawnmower in the front yard. You can't go and take the lawnmower and walk away with it. It's not your own. But when they do this when they're young, and they're obstinate, especially the obstinate, they do the bad and they're like, yeah, what's the problem? That's where the rod come in. You're like, what do you mean, what's the problem? You, you just stole some of the thing and you're going to ask me what's the problem? I'm going to show you what the problem is. And when that happened, the child learned not to do it. But as I say, we have a whole generation of young people right now who they depress. Think about it. The mark of the generation that is um, after us, at least after me, is they're depressed. That's their, there's their, their um, calling card. Hello, my name is John and I'm depressed. You know, I should say it with a younger accent. Accent. <laughs> so my name is John. I'm depressed. That's that's their calling card. Everybody's depressed. Everybody have lower self esteem. And you ask them, "How is your lifestyle?" Oh, I'm. I don't listen to my parent. Well, of course you're depressed. You don't listen to your parents. Yeah, and I don't believe in God. Psh, yeah, tell, tell me about it. You you depressed. And so we know the story. We're not gonna have to. I'm not gonna go into that anymore. But Eli's sons continued their shenanigans, as they say, and then God killed them. That's the reality. Because they ain't listening to nobody. Ain't nobody talking to them. As I say, we, you know, what's troubling even when you look at even, you know, going to what's going on in America with young people, black, white, Asian, all of them depressed. Um, what's bad about it? If you go to the black community, right, um, the black people f are afraid of these young people because they're scary. Because they have no fear. So, because nobody ever taught them fear. You go to the white community, they probably don't, not as scary, but they're popping themselves off. The suicide rates are very high. The Asians very depressed also. Um, they're trying to be ace, be the next doctors, and they're under severe pressure, and they, they have no life. Uh, so one group is trying to make it and have no life. The other group is trying to fun, 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 and they have no life either. And for all of them, you can say the one thing about them, they depressed and they are not uh, drugs whether it be legal or illegal drugs because they need drugs to have them give them self-esteem but the one thing is common about them is no no social behavior you you go over to them they in their teens and they can't say hi they can't have a conversation you go to them and they're six and they can't say hi you know to me it's like okay I come over to the parent. I say, hi, hi, Johnny. Johnny just look at me. And the parent just look at me. And I'm like, what? I'll be like, hey, come here, son. One second, Lloyd, come here, son. And I start spanking him and I bring him back. Then I, say, then I bring him back. He's going to say hi. And he's going to learn. 
but they allow this type of behavior to continue and the child gets older and older and now they don't they have no social skill and now they're depressed of course you're depressed you don't talk to nobody you're rude of course you're gonna be depressed i would be depressed too that's the reality now proverbs 1 verse 17 says the fear of the lord is the beginning of knowledge but fools despise wisdom and instruction fools despise wisdom and instruction you can't talk to a fool <laughs> he hates it can't instruct a fool and i've never met a fool that you could instruct so i've proven this text to be true but this text in the beginning says the fear of the lord is the beginning of knowledge hmm so there's many kids again there's many kids that can't learn and you say why they can't learn because they don't fear no god but they don't fear the person that's standing in the place of god um on the earth is their parents so you can't tell them hey sit down take up a book read study you can't tell them that you bring me a child that's again failing it's a child i can't say kiss it still and nobody can talk to them their parents can't talk to them the teacher can't talk to them. I can't talk to them. You see that? Because the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. So somebody said, well, how do you apply that Lord to school? Think about it with me here. If you have no fear for no one, and I'm not talking about respect, because I remember I had to deal with this years, years ago. I would be in a church and the people were talking about, oh, when the Bible says fear, it's not talking about fear, it's talking about respect. And I'm like, okay, let, let me think about that. And as the years roll by, like, mm, that don't make no sense. This it, it, is, you know, I fear lightning, right? I don't respect lightning, I fear the lightning. There's a difference. I fear hurricane. I don't respect the hurricane. I fear the hurricane. So, for me, the hurricane is coming. I'm getting out of there. If I can't get out, I'm getting out. And then what happened, we'll figure out the rest later. But because I fear, I'm not calling for no rescue. Because I'm going to get out of there before I call for rescue. I'm not going to call, sit there and say, oh, well, you know, I'm not, I'm not fear the hurricane. Um, I respect it. So I'm going to sit here and then when the lights go and then my house start flooding, then I'm going to be like, hey, you guys could get me out of here. Uh, you foolish. I, I don't care what nobody said. You foolish. I'm out. I'll figure it out the rest later. They can come and loot my house. They're going to get some nice equipment, but I can lose this equipment. I would not stay here for this equipment. All right. The fear of the Lord is a beginning, but they're going to be there. Oh, I fear tornadoes. Somebody said, but aren't you a Christian and love cast out of fear? Yeah. Love for what? You tell me the love that cast out the fear for a tornado. It had nothing to do with no love and nothing like that. It just had to do with I'm sensible. If I can get out of the tornado um, way, I'm getting out. If I have to go underground or whatever, I go underground. So somebody say, "Oh, you're scared of cat? I'll be a scared of cat. I'm getting out." So again, a child has no fear for nothing. And somebody say, "Oh, look at him. He's so bold. Oh, look at Johnny. He's so bold. He just he just talk to anybody anyway, and he just curse at them. Oh, he's so bold." He don't care. The next thing you know, oh, we're burying Johnny because Johnny has no behavior and the police have to shoot him <laughs> like a wild animal. Because that's what's basically happening. You know, like when you have a wild animal and the police realize that they lose a natural fear for human beings. And, you know, they say, man, we're going to put this bear down. And they've tracked the bear down and shot it. And there's many young people today that the police going to track down and shoot them or lock them in a cage because they had no fear. And all the parents had to do was... Practice discipline, sit down, read your book, keep quiet, so forth. And then when they're out of control, spank that child with a rod. And that would save the parents out there. But if, oh, my boys are no, they're not behaving themselves. Yeah, because you're weak and you, you're coward and you're not man. And that's why your, your boys are out of control. And now they're whipping your buttocks, right? So that's what happened to Samuel. Samuel watched his two sons die because they didn't learn the fear of the Lord and they started sinning against God. And God said, man, I'm going to wipe them out. And to this day, as I said, today, we go, there's a lot of young kids that are going to die. And you, I'm guaranteed you go to the parents that believe in the Oprah Winfrey more than they believe in the Bible. Sorry to call her name. Because they believe, oh no, it's going to cause them 
to have depression or they're going to have low self-esteem. Oh yeah, he's confidence, all right. He's confidence in wickedness. Hey, look, let's look, sorry. Let's look at this Le Leviticus 19 verse 32. Leviticus 19 verse 32 says, Thou shalt rise up before the hoary head. That's mean people with some gray hairs. And under the face of the old man and fear thy God, I am the Lord. Notice the Lord always say, I am the Lord. So somebody said, why does he keep saying, I am the Lord? Because you need to remember who brought you to Egypt. Egypt. You need to remember who drowned the big old tough, the big tough mighty Pharaoh who's killing all these kids, the, 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 the Hebrew kids. When it says the fear of the Lord, we are talking about Mambi Pambism now. This is a false teachings of religion. Like I was covering yesterday about forgiveness. People teach Christ and teach Christ, teach it, make it seem like Christ some wimp. And Christ is there begging, please, forgiveness, forgiveness. And then I say, you show me, like I saw you talk about yesterday, you show me an example of Christ just going around. You forgiven, you forgiven, you forgiven. You found that? And no, no example of that in the Bible. So, you know, then you have to go back to his teaching and analyze. What is Christ actually saying? Imagine if you took Christ's principle and trained your child the way Christ says it. Christ never displayed it, and God doesn't do that. But you say Christ says you should forgive 70 times 7. So 70 times 7 in a day, if your child misbehaves, you never discipline them. Every time they do something wrong, you say, forgiven? So imagine a child go and you take a knife and cut your sofa. Whoop! And you say, do you just say I should forgive you 70 times 7? So whoop, you're forgiven 70 times 7. And a, you just say, forgiven? Child go burn something in your house, you put out the fire and say, forgiven? Everything the child do, forgiven, and you do that until the child become an adult. You have a, probably a serial killer, killer on your hand. A mass murderer. Out of control. And there's people who will say to me, yes, that's the way to do it. You just go around. Everything the child do, you forgiven, 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 forgiven. And now the child grow up and they become a priest and they start raping little kids. And then the Pope says, forgiven, forgiven, forgiven. All these kids, 200 some kids, one priest. You're forgiven of all those you never have to face the consequence. No prison time. Because that's what they believe. No prison. You don't have to go. You don't have to, no consequence. Did Christ say to the thief on the cross when he disrespected him? Forgiven? Aha. Uh -huh. Oh, he's on the cross now. We must preach the cross, Lord. They would say. Did Christ say, forgiven? No. Christ said to the one that repented, you will be with me in paradise. The other wretch over there, sinful wretch, he's going he to he he fail him and the devil going to be burning. See, there's a difference. So you, you take the Bible principle there through and through. And you follow the Bible principle and you find that they're rock solid. It's not what they're saying. Now, if a person asks for forgiveness, you know, if a child come and say, hey, look, this is how I would say. Say the child now tore or cut, literally, was being a fool, cut the sofa. Now here it goes, it gets tight cut the sofa purposely and they say oh man I did wrong their heart smote them and they see the beating coming they see the flash of lightning in the form of a belt coming their way and they come to you now and they say you know I did wrong I really cut your sofa and I really feel sorry for that now you have a test to know if the child is making a fool of you but now you're going to be in a position now that now Christ's words now apply because now the child asks for forgiveness. Now it doesn't mean that forgiveness cannot come with consequence because you see all the time where a person get death penalty or all that but the family forgive them but it doesn't mean the death penalty is removed. There's consequence. So you're going to have to make that mind of what you do. And in that situation it, will be, it could be very logical to say you know I'm not going to spank the child. I'm probably going to do some other discipline and you're going to be grounded for a week or two because you cost me some serious money here. Um, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to be easy on you because, you because you confess the sin. Or you could just let them off. Uh, if, especially if you know you have rapport with the child, you know the child is genuine. They're not playing you like a fool. You understand how that goes? That's the same way God deals. God don't deal indifferent. But you, there'll be theologians, oh no, you must forgive blanket. So, again, it is that discipline because you're teaching a child there's consequences 
to their actions and there's things that they need to avoid. There's foolish choices that they don't need to make. And it's no different with you and I as adults. We are just older children, so to speak. You know, the Bible says that the Lord will correct us. Who we love, he chastise. And so there's, you know, they, we, have, we are more supposed to be at least more adult with it. But a child has to be taught that you just can't go over there and take out, just take any drug and put it in your body. Because there will be consequence. You just can't go and do this and do that and eat anything because there'll be consequences. There are diseases to avoid. But when a child is not taught that and they don't see the, the profound effect of bad choices, they just continue in their bratty ways and then end up hurting themselves. And you're going to suffer more because you're going to see that child hurting and you can't do anything about it because you lost your opportunity. Your opportunity was when they were children. Leviticus 19 verse 32 says, Thou shalt rise up before the hoary head and honor the face of the old man and fear thy God. I am the Lord. Right? So, what is it being taught here? That when a child rises up, a child needs to know, hey, look, you must go give honor to the hoary head and honor the face of the old man. Think about this, why, why this is so important. Again, the same little brother kids, that is in is part of this generation of no discipline, every, free free everything and unlimited love. They call it what they call it un unlimited love. I can't remember the name of it, but it's a word they use where is they falsely say Christ love without limit. I can't remember anyhow. There's a name for it, but they teach this craziness about this unlimited love, and everything has its limit. The kindness have its limits. You know, if, if a child want to take coke, uh, your kindness will have its limits because they can coke out your own house. Now, you, you're living on a bridge because you you just say, uh, I love my child so much, I give them all the money for coke. This is how some of these parents are. And they take the cocaine until they, they, the, the parents have no house. But they say, but at least I love them. And they knew I love them. They're dead now, but <laughs> I love them till they're dead. No, you teach a child to be honorable. And we look at how... Again, important that a lot of these people are training their kids this way. They're not being old and they're being abused by their kids. They're being neglected by the kids because now their, their hair is going gray and the kids have no, they're dishonorable, disrespectful, horrible. And in a way, the parents kind of deserve it because that's what they train the child to be, to have no respect for the hoary head. Very important to consider. They have no respect for the hoary head. But who trained him to have no respect for the hoary head? The parents, again, when we read the story of Eli. Who trained those boys to be bad behaving? The parent. And when they die, guess who's going to suffer? The parent. And that's what happened. So it comes back and bite the parents in the buttocks. The same place they should have spanked the child. So, you can't even think about this now here in 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 6, 7 through 10. 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 7 through 10. You know this, this text, very familiar text, is the love of money text. Now, when you think about it, right, this love of money here is a lack of self control. Where there's something that is cultivated in a person, or the person developed it by their own bad action. But it's something that happens person could be trained to love money or they could develop it themselves and train themselves to love money. But the result of that is that this behavior causes a lot of pain to others. And that's really what the problem is. You see, the child can be so out of control because they were not disciplined to be in control and trained to be in control that the child gives the parents no rest. Right? And because the parents has no rest, the child basically is trained to be dishonorable and have no reverence for the parents' relationship and their home. Or you think about that. And because of that, the child is going to cause a lot of pain and suffering in the parents' home. They're going to encroach on the parents. In other words, my parents' money is not my money. And my parents, um, how would I say this? My parents, I have to be able to give them that space and that respect but if i'm dishonorable and i train and even if they train me what i'm gonna do i'm gonna encroach on their happiness so i'll give you an example say it's time for my parents to retire 
and they train me bad. Now, my parents now have to use their retirement savings. And they're going to have to either bail me out of jail or prison. or No, jail, sorry. They're going to have to be taking their money to send me to rehab. They're going to have to be paying for lawyer fee to help me not get a long time in prison. They're going to have to be probably paying some people on the table to cover for my evil that I've done and whatever I cost them. I'm going to be ripping off, ripping them off, stealing them stuff, stealing their money to support my bad habits, so forth and so on. So now I'm burning my parents' retirement money, but they're old now and they can't wind back the cock of their body to go back to work. And some of them probably have to go back to work. And I've seen that because they lost so much money because of these kids that never disciplined and these kids never fear them. I mean, I say fear, look, somebody say, you really mean fear? Yeah, I mean fear. I mean whacking them and they fear, they're fearful of you. Like, don't do that. When they think about stealing your credit card and running it up, they think about the beatings coming their way and they say, you know what happened? I, I'll leave my parents' credit card alone. That's what I'm talking about. I'm, you know, somebody could hear me talking and say, what is, what is he exactly talking? Does he know in America and we destroy our kids over here? <laughs> um, no, I'm talking about, no. You, you, you see if Eli, I come to them and say, hey, come here, son. <laughs> Let me ask you this. What I hear you guys doing over here? And they say, ah, oh, this is what we're doing. And I say, look, I don't like what you're all doing here. And you take all this rod and start whacking them over the head and then fire them out of the ministry. They probably would have been still alive. They, they would have lost their job and still alive. See, he didn't do that. He just said, son, please. Could you? And, see, and that's what they've trained us to think. That's how Christ was. And you, you read the whole Bible, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and you'd never find an example of that. Christ, oh, please. Could you guys just stop sleeping with all these women and stop disrespecting the ministry? This this is what they you see, but if you say no, number one, the two of you fire, but you see, since you're still on the job and you're my sons, I'm gonna make you feel a few strikes of this rod right here. And um I'm gonna bust your heads up open, crack your head open, and then you're fired. And if you had done that, or somebody said, Well, you didn't have to do that. You could just fire them, fire them. You two are you fired. That would fix the problem. But there's no fear. And so they just talk, talk. I'm going to tell you, like I've seen, I, I remember one time I was somewhere and I see this kid talking to his mother. And I kind of temporarily lost it. Hear me out, because you probably think I did something I shouldn't do. I didn't spy a child. <laughs> I call the child over and say, let me tell you something. I don't know what you do when you're in your house by yourself with your parents. I don't know how you talk to your father, but don't let me see you talking to your mother again like that in front of me. All right? I was mad as ever. And I know the parents were shocked. I was like, I, I, I don't like this. And then I had to learn not to say anything. But in the past, I remember I would say stuff. I would be like, man, you can talk to your dad a certain way because he's a man. He needs to stand down for himself. But your mother probably a certain size. Don't let me see you talk to your mother like that again. Okay, because I, I'm going to be mad. Because, you know, it's not good when you see a, like a teenage boy who's already taller than his mother talking to mother as if you want to grab her and hit her. That's how some of these people have their parents. And I'm like, yeah, he... He has confidence, all right. Yeah. He has some serious confidence. He has no fear of his mother. He has no respect for her. But you're training child. And I think, like, you're a man. You're listening to me. Shame on you. If you allow your child to rush up to the mother. Rush up to the mother, you probably get a kick. Like, you don't make your child. I don't care if a child is, you know, eight. And he rush up to his mother like he want to hit his mother. Like, what? You bad? You're going to rush up. Man, rush up to me, but don't rush up to the woman. Don't train your son, especially a son. I'm like probably less concerned about a female, but especially a boy, to be rushing up to his mother and hitting his mother. Like what? You're a boy. You know, you I hear you grow up and beating your wife. That's to me is the issue. But people, go, oh no! But if you beat him, he's gonna have self-esteem problem. No, you can't make your son rush up to the mother and hit the mother. Like, boy, you want me to hit your head off? 
You go hitting your mother like that. But there's fathers all day long who sit there worthless. I see a father doing that, my mother, this guy's worthless. I'm making their son hitting their mother. Like, you crazy and worthless. Shame on you. Anyhow, back to my present day. So, in First Timothy chapter 6, verse 7 through 10, it says, For we brought nothing into this world, and for certain we cannot take nothing out. And having food and raiment, let us there be there with content. But they that will be rich fall into temptation and a snare into many foolish and hurtful lust, which drawn men in destruction and perdition. For the love of money is the root of all evil, which while some coveted after they have erred from the faith. Now this is what I came for, this last phrase here. They have erred from the faith, and this phrase now, and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. I read all of that for this. <laughs> Does that text came to my mind in that way? Pierce themselves through with many sorrows. Remember I told you, the most undisciplined child or children are the, the miserablest children. And I've never seen that principle being proven wrong. You bring me a miserable wretch, I'm going to tell you it's a person that was never disciplined. Wow. And I've never seen different. Pierce themselves through with many sorrows. The person is don't have no self-discipline, don't have no self-control, pure hurt. Because they believe it's going to work out this way. Just think about it. And I, I didn't want to go through the rest of the text, but if you look at Proverbs 23, you know, this is a big passage here. Big passage. This is the big man passage. <laughs> this is the big, big, big dog in the room. This passage here. All of them is great, but... This is one of those big ones. Because next thing he's going to talk about a whore is a deep pit. And then next thing he's going to talk about alcohol. If you read on the bottom of Proverbs 23. So you think about that, right? Why would that be so important? You know, why would you say, Woe unto uat woes. That's the famous text. I'm going to cover that in a few weeks by God's grace. And then a whore is a deep ditch. And that comes after you must beat the foolishness out of the child. I believe it's significant. <laughs> because, as you know, what you're doing is you're training a child to know that a whore is a deep pit. So somebody said, well, Lord, I don't get it. How could you discipline your child? You're trying to teach a child to... To stay away from disobedient and be and doing bad things. How that has to do with a whore is a deep pit. Uh, because it is. <laughs> it just does. You know, just think about it. You you need to learn at an early age cause and effect. And avoid STDs. Avoid a certain lifestyle. You need to learn at a certain age that you can do things in life, you're free to do it, but you do it, you can cause you they could come with bad effect like alcohol. And so it's important for this to be taught at an early age. It's important for you to teach your child at an early age because it's another big text we'll cover in the future about wine bibbers and the result of being a wine bibber. The result of being a, a person who is a riotous eater of meat. Remember the Bible in the Old Testament say that a child that is a glutton and disobedient, they should be brought to the elders and then stoned. Right? Why are you going to stone your child? Wouldn't it be better for just discipline a child with some spanking than to get to a point where you have to stone a child because the child is totally lost control? Just think about our society with so many people are beasts. That's the other thing too. So many people are beasts and they have no self-control. It's either love for money, obesity, drugs, bad behavior, gang banging, and all of this has one root. The breakdown of the home, the man start being a, stop being a man, he's a wimp. He refused to discipline his children. And the end result is that the child grows up and have no self-control. They are wine bibbers. They are drunks. They are disobedient to anything, any authority. They are violent. They are on drugs. They they, they, they are sadistic. They are sensual. They are worshipping false gods. They are worshippers of Baal or Baphomet. All of this is coming out of the one thing disobedient to parent this is why i remember the bible says it is this promise that this commandment the commandment to honor thy father and thy mother 
upon this commandment is the commandment with a promise long life if you you don't obey your parents and you don't see the benefit or the point of rules regulations i'm gonna tell you you you're gonna die young or you're gonna die a miserable life with all kind of stds and health problems because you're smoking and you're taking you know cocaine and the the, the the various different detergents and chemicals in the cocaine is rotting out your sinuses and now you you're die you're alive but you're living with rotten flesh inside your head and all could have been avoided if your parents says oh you don't understand foolishness whack and then you're like oh i get it there's cause and effect i do this this is what happened so we get older you know oh i hit that crack pipe this is going to be the result. Because many people believe they're going to hit the crack pipe or hit the meth or the, the fentanyl or whatever. And it's going to be great. It's going to be great. And the parents are going to say, hey, boy, come here, boy. What are you doing over there? What are you doing? Some quick points here on discipline and why discipline has to be prompt and exact. When I say discipline, I'm talking about the discipline of life. And so first, as I taught other times, you have to discipline your child in the functions of life before physical discipline is ever brought to bear. It's when this type of discipline breaks down. So first thing, um, time is important. Part of discipline is for the child to be brought up to know it's time for breakfast, time for lunch, time to get up, time to go to sleep, time to study, time to go play. There's a time and a place for everything. The child has to be brought in. That's the first era of discipline because time. It's also teach a child time, but it's a teacher child that there's a circadian rhythms and there's a rhythm to life. In other words, we don't, we're not creating this out of nowhere. The sun sets and the sun rises. It's just, that's life. There's a probation. You, if you don't get it done a certain amount of time, it gets cut off. Today's preparation day. Tomorrow is the Sabbath. Sunday is the first day of the week. That's just life. There's a time. There's a time to wash the clothes. Uh, and as a matter of fact, with discipline, do not train your children that you can't stop long enough to help, help to teach them to help you to do this, the work. When it's time to wash the clothes, it's okay for them to sometimes sit there and play a game or something or read a book. But it's time for them to learn. It's time for you to come and join me to wash the clothes. Then it must be part of life. You're training them to do life. You just limit the training when they're younger. So time is very important because that's part of discipline. See, so you start out with the discipline of time and also the discipline of um, expediency. There's things that I can't get done today, but I can get it done tomorrow. So I need to get it done today. So if I'm doing this, I need to know you need to be all hands on deck today, not tomorrow. It's different. We can kick back a little bit, but we need to get it done today. That's part of the discipline that has to get going. Regularity has to be part of discipline. Without regularity, the child is not going to learn to have discipline. And it's going to, life's going to be difficult for them because everything in life comes with regularity. So there's some things you do it and do it until they bleed. That's the reality of life. And that's what makes success. Success is not doing the same thing, you know, as something good. One time is doing it over and over and over again. You could come here, you can hear me talk, and you could come back, you could you could join me tomorrow at church or live on the live stream as I preach, and I'm doing the same thing again. I'm just keep talking, but the more I do it, is it is more my brain become configured. Well, that starts at a young age. You're training a child to do the same thing over and over and over again. Regularity. So regularity has to be part of life. And you have to teach a child that everything is based upon system. The more systematic is the more successful. The less systematic is the less successful. So that's part of life. The child could say, but I'm bored. Yeah, you have to teach a child sometimes you're going to be bored. Because there's things that they're boring in their development, but they're exciting in the ex execution. So you, 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 that's part of life. There's set rules that need to be followed. And so there's rules. Again, we are commandment keeping. We believe in a commandment, but we could be trained not to follow set rules. A child should be trained that there are set rules. And when you have set rules that have um, affect their health, the body has rules that it must follow. 
there's health laws, there's commandment, there is rules to do with finance, how you take care of your, 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 your financial um, situation. All this can be trained in a child when they're young. There are set rules when it comes on to so much things in life that... <laughs> Uh, that my brain failed me here to say as I want to move on to the next point. But there's rules to life. In just like where there's math, chemistry, whatever. There's rules to my body. There's rules to society. And there's set rules. And when you break the rules, you're coming out of whack with not only the society, but with God. When you saw a tree and child with that, they will have less problem in their jobs. They will have less problem with the, the authorities. They know to work with the rule. You we 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 commandment keepers. We train our kids to be commandment keeping. So when they get older, they'll be like, "Oh man, I can't do this." Well, you know, they were not trained. Because the Bible says, if you train a child, they'll learn the ways and they become used to this. And when they ruffle against this, you say, "Well, probably you have the noose too tight, so you loosen the noose. You give them some freedom. If you give them the freedom and they still err, then you say, "Okay, now we're gonna have to bring in the belt." That's how the belt comes in. It's only when you, you realize the situation as a child is rebelling against what they need to be trained under. Punctuality is important. You know, you got to be there and, and be square. Very important because in life, that's all they're going to face. Every day the bell, bell goes off at Wall Street at a certain time. Uh, you be there or you're not. Nine o'clock, I think it goes off and you got to be there at the bell. Um, and so it's important. Um, in this life, as you know, um, we have to give an account to God. And so because we have to give an account to God, it's important for us to know that it's not just God we give an account to. We have to give an account to our family. We have to give an account to our parents. We have to give an account to our jobs. And ultimately, as I say, we have to give an account to God. So, you know, if I ask a child, where were you? In the child to be trained, don't, don't be talking back to me about that. You give me an account, all right? Get a child used to giving an account. And I'm going to tell you, if you give a child... A child used to give an account. I'm going to tell you, you're preparing them for meeting their maker, for the judgment, because they're going to know that one day uh, there's somebody bigger than my parents I'm going to have to give an account to. And that person is the, their creator. And everything that we do, we're just like, uh, I don't know how to describe it. The best way I can describe it is that we're creating the image of God. Let's say it that way. That's cleaner. <laughs> That's what I was thinking. So we're creating the image of God, and so we're just... We're, we're, we're living out what God would have us live out. But when we do this for our children, the children learn, look, give an account. What, 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 where were you? What were you doing? And the child, no, I have to give an account. So you're training the child to be able to give an account because if you know you have to give an account, you're more on your guard. And so what you're doing, you're helping a child form a character that's like Jesus. You're helping a child become a metallical in their behavior and when you do this the better you are at this is the less you'll find if ever you're gonna teach the child you know you're gonna basically don't have to spank a child the less you train a child like this is the more you're gonna have to spank a child the more miserable child is gonna be and the more aggressive they're gonna be and the more resistant they're gonna be against proper um proper um discipline and so you're gonna have to be violent more you don't want to do that you want to Practice these things. I'm going to guarantee you, the more you practice some of these things I just said real quickly there to shoot off, is that you're going to find you're almost going to probably have, you can eliminate spanking. I believe you can, but you have to be very metallic. You have to be able to take every opportunity. When you see some consequence, you teach your child, look, you see, that's the consequence. Even when you mess up, you say, see, if, you say, if, I, didn't do, if I did it this way, that wouldn't happen. So you, your child, no, okay, I don't need to do that because I don't want to beat down. Praise the Lord. I'll close with Proverbs 23, verse 35. They have stricken me. That's the end of the chapter. This is where we're going. They have stricken me, shall thou say, and I was not sick. They have beaten me, and I felt it not. When shall I wake? I will seek it yet again. When a child doesn't learn the discipline, the two types of discipline, that's the only best way I can say it, the child, when the child does not learn the two methods of discipline, whether it be by the, the rod or by daily, you know, regiment, what the child do, the child gets into a lifestyle where they're taking drugs, alcohol, they're running down money, and they're piercing themselves through with many sorrows, and they keep piercing themselves because they don't know how to do better, because they don't know better. They never learn the, 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 the easy way. They learn the hard knocks way, and they keep going after that drugs, and the drugs whipping them, and they can't give it up. We don't want that to happen to our children. 
We don't want that to be our story. As adults, we need to learn, even as adults, especially as adults, um, that look, they don't need to strike me, strike me or beat me. I'm going to do it the right way. I don't need no striking. You just strike me the first time. After a while, speak to me. I don't like the beat down. That's how we need to be in life. We need to be like Jesus. Strike me once. The second time, just talk to the rock. They will come for water. And we need to be like that. We need to be converted, in other words, by God's grace. Let's pray. Thank you, Lord, again for your love, the mercies that you continue to bestow upon us. Pray that you may bless each and every one here, dear Lord, that we might have the heart, the strength, dear Lord, to not discipline, per se, even for our children, but more so discipline ourselves. You know, Jesus, that most of the people, it's the adults that need discipline and they need the whacking. So I pray, dear Lord, that you may help us as adults to be converted and that will help our children be converted, that they don't have to go through the hard hits. Bless us, we pray, as we go through this pre preparation day. And may your spirit be with us, we pray for Christ's sake. Amen. Thanks for being with me here on Revival Forum Radio. Looking forward to talking to you live soon. Until then, I pray that you may continue to walk with the King. Mm -hmm.